come to order now. First of all, I would like to say good morning to everybody. Today is August the 7th, 2022, Bible study guide number 10. Today's title, A New Home. A New Home. The background scripture comes from Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 8. The printed text is also Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 8. And this morning, our devotional reading will come from Revelation chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. At this time, I would like for everyone to join me in a verse of song. <clears throat> Jesus, keep me near the cross. As a fresh, just found fountain, free to all a hill and stream flow from Cary Mountain. In the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever, till my wrath just so shall find rest beyond the re river. Good morning. This morning I bring to you from Revelation chapter 15 verses 1 through 8. And I saw another sign in heaven and great and marvelous seven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name. Stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works. Lord, o Lord God Almighty, just and true as thou ways, thou kings of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy, for all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgment are made, are made manifest. And after that I looked, and behold, the temple of the temp tabernacle, a testimony in heaven it was open. And the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plates, clothed in pure and white lining, and having them breast girdled with gold girdles, and one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven gold vows for the wrath of God, who live forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of the God, and from his power, and no man was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were filled. I read from Revelation chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. Thank you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, creator of heaven and earth. Father God, we want to thank you this morning for just waking us up. We thank you, Father, for touching us with that finger of love. Thanking you, Father God, for our health and our strength. First of all, Father, we want to thank you for your darling son, Jesus, that died on the cross, Father, for all our sins. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. Father God, we pray that you continue to protect us each and every day. Father God, we done made it through this coronavirus. Now, Father God, we got these monkey pox that came along. We pray that you continue to just keep your arms wrapped around us. We pray that you touch our members this morning, Father, to come out and hear a word from you. They don't have to stay at home, Father. They can come out and hear a word from you live. We pray for our sick and our shut-in. We pray for our bereaved family. We pray that you bless our services this morning from the Sunday school throughout the morning service. Bless the pastors. He brings the word. Bless everyone that's bowing me in prayer. These blessings we ask in your darling son in Jesus name we pray amen <clears throat> I'm so glad so glad trouble don't last always oh I'm so glad 
Trouble don't last always. I'm so glad, so glad. Trouble don't last always. Oh, my Lord, oh, my Lord, what shall I do? What shall I do? I'm so glad God is using me. Oh, I'm so glad God is using me. I'm so glad, so glad God is using me. Oh, my Lord. Oh, my Lord, what shall I do? What shall I do? I would like to thank everyone for participating in our opening services this morning. And at this time, we will turn it over to Ram Connor for our Sunday school lesson. Thank you, Deke. Good morning, everyone. How's everyone doing this morning? Truly, indeed, a blessed day in the middle of the Lord's house one more time. Just giving praise and thanks to our Lord and Savior for allowing us to be here today. But this morning we have another wonderful lesson in store. This morning talking about a new home, a new home. And so this morning as we prepare to get started in the lesson, let us continue to be in prayer for our families, for our communities, um, and most definitely for our nation during this time. And so let us just keep um everyone lifted up in prayer and so as we look into our lesson this morning talking about a new home our bible background comes from revelations 21 verses 1 through 8 printed text is the same and our devotion reading came from revelations 15 1 through 8 and so our aim for change this morning tells us that we will examine the unique genre uh, of apocalypse uh, that characterizes revelation in order to discern how to understand this message contemplate the creation of a new heaven and a new earth for the hope that this vision holds for the faithful and embrace the peace of god that begins in this life with jesus and continues in god's new creation and so that is our aim for change this morning and so as we look into our background this morning it tells us that the book of Revelation uh, records four visions of John. And so the first vision in 1, um, verse 12 to chapter 3, verse 22, is of Jesus and his messages to the seven churches. The second vision from chapter 4, uh, verse 1 through uh, chapter 13 and verse 18, depicts Jesus Christ at the throne of God. And then the opening of the seven seals and the seven trumpet blasts. And then the third vision is from chapter 14, verse 1 uh, through chapter 16, 21, describes Christ on Mount Zion. And so our lesson today, it opens with the beginning of the fourth vision in which we will learn about the ultimate fulfillment of God's promise in Christ, the holy city, and the new Jerusalem. And so as we get started this morning, um, we're going to first look at the presentation, the presentation from Revelation 21 uh, verses 1 through 2. And I know many people get, I guess, kind of timid or um, with, with, with the book of Revelations, but um, it, it's not so bad once you get to studying and really looking at um, what is being presented out of the book of Revelations. Even when you look through and study on the imagery and all the examples that the book gives. But we will see out of this lesson this morning after we break it all down, really what we have to look forward to and the things that we have to do to get there. And so let's look at the presentation first, Revelations 21 verses 1 through 2. Someone read those two verses for me. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there were no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city of New Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. All right. 
And see, as we look at these first two verses, let us first talk about John. Uh, John, it is believed that he wrote the, the Gospel of John, three epistles, and the book of Revelation. And so John, he, he wasn't um, martyred um, as the rest of the disciples were. But he was in prison on the Isle of Patmos uh, for his faith in Jesus Christ. And this is where he wrote the book of Revelation. And so Revelations 21 and 22 present us with the Bible's longest and best portrait of what people commonly call heaven. Although what is actually shown is a new heaven and a new earth coming down from God out of heaven. And so Isaiah 65 and 17 also predicted new heavens and a new earth. And so Peter, he also wrote um, of a cosmic changeover or a total transformation. And so it describes a time when the current heavens shall pass away and be dissolved in fire and the earth shall be burnt up. And so this will make room for the new heavens and new earth. Uh, out of 2 Peter 3 and 13. And so two key images used here are that of the holy city and of the bride. And so Paul introduces the idea of a Jerusalem which is above as part of his web of metaphors to explain the uh, Christian new freedom from the law. And so this new Jerusalem is filled with what? Joy instead of terror as Sinai was. Uh, in it dwell the general assembly in the church, the justified saints, all the host of angels, and God and Jesus himself. And so I hope y'all caught that, what's gonna, who's going to dwell in this new Jerusalem, in this new heaven, in this new earth. It says the general assembly in church, the justified saints, and all the host of angels, and God and Jesus himself. So, just as the groom wants to be with the bride, Christ wants to be with his church. And she has been made ready for him. So now let's dig a little bit. The word adorned in Greek is cosmio. This verb comes from the noun cosmos, which is the Greek word for the ordered world and also means ornament. And so from this Greek word, we get our word, what? Cosmetics. Interesting, huh? So those who are believers have received new life. As Christ begins the process of beautifying each Christian as a member of his bride. We have been charged to walk in a newness of life through the power of the Holy Spirit. We are to put aside Old ways of thinking. Y'all look back at this word cosmetics. Now I'm going to deal with this a little bit. We are to put aside our old ways of thinking, speaking, and living in order to fulfill God's plan for us. We must live with the goal of showing others the way to the new city of God. Now let's go back and deal with this word cosmetics. We are to put aside old ways of thinking, speaking, and living in order to fulfill God's plan for us. What is so interesting about this word cosmetics, women? Got to pick on my women now. Because as men, we don't wear cosmetics. <laughs> us men, we don't wear cosmetics. <laughs> So, <laughs> Sister Ghost, <laughs> let's deal with this word, <laughs> cosmetics. Women, why do we, why do y'all put on cosmetics? What's y'all reason behind putting that on? Uh, to enhance our beauty. Yeah. Enhance yeah. your beauty. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Enhance your beauty. I like that, Sister Ghost. You want to enhance your beauty, cosmetics. So let's look at this enhancement of your beauty. Why are we to put on 
Christ. Sister Gosen said it, to enhance our beauty, to enhance Christ in you. So when you put on cosmetics, women, when you put on cosmetics, what happens? It changes your outer appearance. It changes it. And so if we are to put on Christ, if we are to become new and put on Christ, we got to put on our cosmetics spiritually that's going to change and enhance our beauty, which means you become what? A new creature. You are beautified. Because, now let's just be real now, man, we love our wives, but there are some that when they wake up in the morning, they ain't like Beyonce, they didn't wake up like this, as the song says. And when they put on those cosmetics, they are what? New. You know, they change. And then you got the googly eyes and everything else. But now for some, when they take it off, <laughs> you see the imperfections. You see the wrinkles. You see the blemishes. You see all of this. But when they put that, those cosmetics on, you don't see none of that now, do you? So what I'm getting at is this. When we put on Christ, that covers those blemishes, that covers those imperfections when you put on Christ. And so we are to put on our spiritual cosmetics. We are to be adorned, uh, and we are to be an ornament for who? For Jesus Christ. We are his, what, bride. And so those who are believers have received a new life as Christ begins his process of beautifying each Christian as a member of of his bride. And so that is what we're supposed to do. Put on Christ. And so what kinds of images and feelings does bride bring to mind? What kinds of images and feelings does bride bring? When you think about a bride, what does that mean to you when you say bride? Give me some examples. She's about to begin a new life. What else does bride bring to mind? My beautiful wife. Your beautiful wife. Pureness. Pureness. What about devotion? Commitment. You know, dedication. We can throw all those words in there. So, when we look at those words and those images, why are those helpful in understanding the relationship between Christ and and the church. When you think about those words with bride, think about commitment. See, why are those helpful in understanding the relationship between Christ and the church? Shouldn't we be committed to Christ? See, think about being a husband and a, and, and a wife. There's commitment. There's devotion. There's love. There's a relationship. You know, there's communion. There's all those things when we think about a marriage. And so when we talk about our relationship with Christ, shouldn't we be committed? <laughs> you know, shouldn't we be devoted? Shouldn't we spend time with Christ? Husband, wives, don't, don't you like your, you know, your loved one to spend time with you? You know, I hear it all the time from my wife about, you know, we work so much, we need to spend some time together because we too busy. <laughs> Look, got to spend some QT, some quality time. You know, you just can't work, 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 so far ago, and don't spend no time, time, time with each other. You know, uh, I'm still young and spunky, so, you know, you got to spend a little time together, Sister Reese. And so, when we think about this word bride, and we think about the images and, and, and the words that come along with it. That is why we should understand the relationship that we should have with Christ as a church. You know, the same thing applies. And so now let's move on. Let's talk about the proclamation. Uh, Revelations 21 verses 3 through 4. Someone read that for me. heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, 
and he would dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Hallelujah. Mm. Now that's where y'all need to get your shot on right there. Because now let's look at this. In Old Testament times, God localized and centralized his presence with his people where? At the tabernacle. In New Testament times, God came in the form of a man, Jesus, and dwelt among his people. Now in Greek, the word dwell is uh, skeno, skeno. This is literally the word for pit, to pitch a tent. So reinforcing the connection between the incarnation and the tabernacle, which was a tent. And so here on earth, our sense of God's presence is often dimmed or interrupted or obscured. God dwells with us through what? The Holy Spirit. And we perceive him by what? Faith. So in Old Testament times, he dwelt with his people where? At the tabernacle. Then in the New Testament times, he came in the form of what? A man, Jesus Christ. His son came. So now, currently, God dwells with us through what? The Holy Spirit. And we perceive him. We can't see him, we can't touch him, but we perceive him by what? Faith. But in the holy city now, we will live in full measure of God's physical presence. You stand there and talk to him. You're going to be with him in his what? Full presence. Let that stick in your mind now. When we are struggling through life here on earth, we can rejoice in the hope that one day we will live with our loving creator never to be parted from him what? Ever again. While on earth we enjoy some of the blessings of being children of God which is what? Salvation, peace, joy, wisdom, and all other things you can tag on to that. But when the new Jerusalem arrives, we will fully be his people, and he will be our God, and we will what? Dwell together. Y'all let that stick in your mind now. God speaks directly at the beginning and at the end of the book of Revelation. Each of those who receives Christ in, in this life it's already a new creation. But we live in a sinful world until the time that it will become what? New. All the sad and terrible things of this present world will be no more in heaven because they are the result of sin, but they're going to be cleared away. So now think about that while we're struggling and going through this thing we call life. One day all this is going to come to an end. All we have to do, we know God through the Holy Spirit. We, we have to live a life for the Lord through faith. He's not in our presence physically. But it's going to come today soon and very soon when you're going to be in his presence. you looking at him. You're talking to him. You're right there with him. Now, I'm going to deal with his presence here a little bit more. But you're going to be right there with him. And all of this, all your tears, all your worries, all this stuff we going through, struggling through life. Whew, gone. It's going to be gone. So, let's get into the good stuff now. The promises. Revelation 21, 5 through it. I wish I could see some of y'all viewing us online so I can see who's going to be shouting first. <laughs> Revelation 21, some read, someone read verses 5 through 8 for me. And he sat upon the throne and said, and he, and he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Mm. And he said unto me, Right, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, 
in the beginning and the end. And I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. And I will be his God. And he shall be my son. But the, the fearful and the unbelief and the abominable and the murders and the whole month and the sorcerers and the adultery and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, mm. which is in which is the second death. Second death. Yeah. <laughs> let, let, me, let me just put a little plug. Look, let, let me put a little plug on y'all mind right quick. Look, think, think about, think about an inheritance. Think about a will. When you leave this world, you know, you got a will. You leave an inheritance for your family, your kids. Let me ask you a question. How does your name get put on those documents to inherit what I'm going to leave you? You got to be family, right? You got to be family. Because I'm not going to leave an inheritance, Sister Fargo, to a total stranger that I don't know, that I have no relationship with. <laughs> you have to be what? Family. You have to be my son, my daughter, my wife, you know, a husband. You know, you have to be family. So let's look at this. He that sat upon the throne is the Father God. Described in iconic detail in earlier vision, Revelations 4, 1 through 6. God calls out, I make all things new. God is working on our behalf, transforming us, listen to me class, into the image of his dear son. Think about this will and this inheritance now, because this is what we're finna deal with. And readying us for the day when we will completely be new. Now, let me hit you. How do you think you're going to sit in the presence of God if you don't believe in his son, Jesus Christ? Because in order for you to sit in God's presence, saints, <laughs> you got to believe. And you got to be a reflection and image of his son, Jesus Christ. God is not giving you no inheritance and letting you sit in at the throne if you ain't, <laughs> you think you're going to go to heaven any kind of way. You're going to heaven anyhow. And your sinful lifestyle, no, you're not. God calls out that he will make all things new. And he's working on behalf, transforming us into the image of his dear son. Look at 2 Corinthians 3 and 18. And readying us for the day when we will completely be new. God began everything by his will, and he will bring his plan to fruition. Just as Jesus said it is finished when his work which was provided for our salvation was complete, so also God will announce it is done at the end of human history. So our sovereign God, the Alpha and Omega, is the beginning and the end of what? All things. The one who once offered a woman at the well living water and said that living water could spring up inside of his people promises to give us unto those who thirst of the fountain of water of life freely. So by these illusions, John hopes to communicate that God's people can think of the present world as what? Captivity. We in captivity now, y'all. And it's coming as a return to our what? True home. So I guess, guess I need to ask the question. Don't y'all want to go home? Because we love in this world called life. We, we love in this. But if you look at it in a spiritual sense, Deacon McKenzie, we in captivity. Because let's go back. We are experiencing some of the blessings. Deacon Harry, and we're experiencing some of the blessings. So, Parker, we just getting a little bit. You know, you ever feed somebody just crumbs? You just get them just a little bit. You just getting just a little bit. Don't you want the full plate? Don't you want the full buffet instead of just getting a little bit? 
So, this is where when we go back home, this is where he will bless us, what? Abundantly. See, it, 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 it tickles my spirit that we run around here and, 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 and I'm not trying to talk about folks, but I'm blessed and highly favored. I'm blessed and highly favored. Man, I want the fullness of my blessings. And you ain't getting the fullness of your blessings here on earth. Yes, we are blessed. Yes, you can be highly favored. But honey child, you're just getting a little inkling of what God really has for us. So we can say we experiencing a good life while we're here. But there is so much more when we get in the presence of our Lord, of, of God. So many people today do not lack physical water with which to quench their thirst. But they do lack what they need to quench their spiritual thirst. You might have a bottle of water, but see our spiritual thirst, we drying out. So as believers, we are compelled to hold out the promises of living water to unbelievers, as Jesus did with the woman at the well. But even though we serve and love God here on earth, our thirst to know him and dwell in his presence is never fully quenched. Saints, we are not whole yet. <laughs> Amen. It's coming. God tells us in his word, you know, that, that he can bless us in such a way that our cup would just run over. Now, let's, let's think about that for a moment. You, you, you do what's right. You give, you support, you, you work. And God tells you he, he will bless you in such a way that your cup will just run over. Think about that. Now, think about this. When we finally get to heaven, how you going to think you're going to feel, Sister Teresa, when your cup explodes? Not just running over, Sister, when it explodes. Because why? There ain't no room in this cup. It just can't just run over. It just, it got to explode. Because Deacon McKinney, it's just, it's just everywhere. The blessings is just, it's just too much to be held in this little container. And so, even though we serve and love God here on earth, our thirst to know him and dwell in his presence is never fully quenched. Only when we reach that new city will our thirst for God be replaced with his eternal presence. And so in the Greek, the word overcometh is nikeo, which can mean to be, what, victorious. And he uses the word often in his epistles. And there we see the overcomer is a Christian. Listen now, who conquers the evil one and the whole world. So John says our faith is the victory we gain over the world and our faith is that Jesus is the son of God. A Christian is intended to be a world conqueror to hold fast to the belief that faith in Christ conquers temptations and persecutions. Not only does God make all things new, but the Christian um, overcomer shall what? Inherit all things. We will belong to God as his children for all eternity. We are his heirs. You have to put on Christ. If you want to be in the presence of God, you have to put on Christ. So let's break this down a little bit. My class, what can stand in the presence of God? This, talk about the Bible now. Can sin be in the presence of God? So why do we think we can go to heaven anyway? In any, any old kind of way and anyhow. Sin cannot be in the presence of God. Sickness can't be in the presence of God. Stress 
PTSD, all this stuff. It cannot be in the presence of God. Now, what can be in the presence of God? Because who's sitting at the throne now? Jesus Christ. Who's covering us by his blood? Jesus Christ. So that tells me, Sister Fargo, that I need a direct infusion of Jesus' blood to be in the presence of who? God. So if God is changing us, making us into the image of his son, that's the only way you can be in his presence. So why do we have some people sit around here and think, if they really reading their Bible, that you don't have to believe in Jesus Christ and you think you're going to go to heaven anyhow? God is not looking for good people. He's looking for saved people. Mm-hmm. And if you think you're going because of the good things you've done, you're not saved. Mm. You're going to go where this right here is saying, it's burning. Going to verse 8. <laughs> <laughs> going to verse 8. You know? Okay. Call the verse out. You're going to bust verse 8 wide open. <laughs> Yes, Sister Gustav wants to say that. <laughs> Let's look at this last sobering verse. <laughs> look. And so when we look at this last verse, it tells us that not all will be overcomers. <laughs> Dean McKenzie. Not all are what? True followers of Jesus Christ. Those who are not will face what? Eternal judgment. Now, unbelievers, since y'all think, you know, just coming to church, you know, hey, that's good enough. You know, I'm, I'm good. Unbelievers are found in many places, even in the church. We got unbelievers in church house, y'all. These are those who, who have not put their trust in Jesus Christ as their Savior. You got to put Jesus Christ. (laughs) Ain't no other way. You got to put your trust in Jesus Christ. So saying that Jesus was just some old prophet. uh, And you just exclude Jesus out the equation. No, 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 no. Verses like this, this one compels us to tell others. How to be saved. Why? Because hell is real. The Greek word for fear for fearful is delos, which means timid or cowardly. But it also implies faithless. If we consider the context of persecution under Rome, it helps us to see that John was thinking of those who were too afraid to stand for Christ. Do y'all know anybody like that? What is condemned is letting fear keep us from standing up for our love for Christ. You cannot let fear overtake you that you don't stand up for Christ. The abominable are those who have allowed themselves to be saturated with the sinfulness of this world. Decadent ways of living were common in the days of the Roman Empire, which John lived in. And who can deny the decadence of our world today? So, we must make a concerted effort to keep our thoughts, our values, our words, and our actions, what? Clean before God. Your actions, your attitude, and your behavior. Saints, class, y'all be on this live. It must be clean before God. So, then we come to murderers. John may have been thinking of those who persecuted Christians until their deaths, but before we clear ourselves, class, we should remember that Jesus said, Whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Look at Matthew 5, 22. What is this saying? We may congratulate ourselves because we never use the word murderer to describe ourselves. We ain't never killed nobody. 
Have we? Have we? Now let's think about the time when somebody cuts you off in traffic and you said you idiot or something else to that driver. Isn't that kind of the same? Think about how you done lied on somebody and damaged their reputation, damaged their name. You done killed them with your tongue. You're talking about them. You're running them down. You ain't got to stab nobody. You ain't got to shoot nobody. We do enough killing saints with our tongues. And, and my wife often tell our kids, keep your mouth off, folks. Youth, adults especially, keep your mouth off, folks. If you can, and I think I've heard Pastor said, I have heard other folks say it. If you can't say nothing good, but don't say nothing at all. Just keep your mouth closed. If they low down, you don't need to say it. <laughs> Look, you right, bro. Look, they probably know it. <laughs> they actions telling you. You ain't got to accentuate it and just talk about it. Just leave it alone. So, we can kill people in more ways than just bullets and knives or such. You can kill them with your tongue. And so it's a wise thing. Keep your mouth off, folks. Next, we're going to deal with homemongers. Talking about this last verse. Sister goes, verse 8, going to bust it wide open. Our fornicators, those who have sexual relations outside of marriage. In our culture, it is common for unmarried couples to live together. I know some of y'all are going to be mad, but it's okay. You'll be all right. I'm sticking to the word, but it's definitely against God's word. The next to be thrown into the lake of fire are what? Sorcerers and idolaters. This describes the worship of anything other than God, the one true God. What are you worshiping over God? Is it your money? Is it your house? Is it your cars? Is it your clothes? Is it your, y'all forgive me women, is it your hair? You know, what are you worshiping? Is it a man? Is it a woman? What are you worshiping over God? What are the things? Because we got a whole lot of stuff. You know, Sister Colleen, we got a whole lot of stuff going on in our lives. So what are we putting before God? I'm not saying it's, it's wrong with you to beautify yourself, you know, with your hair, your makeup, and all this stuff. Ain't nothing wrong with that. But here's the thing. Are you putting that over God? Are you putting your husband over God? Are you putting your kids over God? You know, are you putting some materialistic things over God? You know, and if you are, so it goes Big McKenzie, you're going to bust chapter, verse 8, wide open. <laughs> so, this describes a worship of anything other than the one true God. And most often, some aspects of God's creation. From other human beings, to superstitions, to various material objects. Verse 8 covers the whole gamut of everything. And the last in this list is what? Liars. Do y'all know any liars? <laughs> <sighs> Included in this title are those who are insincere, those who lie by their silence, or those who practice any other kind any other kind of untruth. Those who claim to follow Christ, but actually, what it says, do not, uh, those who claim to follow Christ, but actually do not, would also be in what? Included. You claim to follow Christ, but you don't follow Christ. You claim to be on the Lord's side, but you ain't on the Lord's side. You insincere, 
You keep silent on injustices or things that you see that are wrong pertaining to Christianity or those who practice other kinds of untruth. You can see people say so many things about race, about politics, about all these other different things. And none of it falls in line with the word of God. What are we doing, saints? What are we doing? We can put on our money and God we trust. But do we? Because when it comes to our money, some of us, we ain't trusting God. Think about the things that we do. Our actions, our attitude, our behaviors. Think about the things that we do. Are we liars? As we examine this list and ourselves, chances are that most of us know that we are guilty of some of these sins. Just be real. I can be the first to say I'm guilty of some of these sins. And see, this is what we have to understand. For y'all want to damn me to hell. This is what you got to understand. We need to be working on ourselves. You need to pull a Michael Jackson. You need to look at the man in the mirror. You need to look at that reflection coming back out that mirror. And you need to work on you. And I can say I'm working on me. Because here's the thing. Thanks be to the grace and mercy of God. Lord bless, today ain't my last day. So that means what, Sister Fargo? I got another minute to work on myself. <laughs> So, Teresa, I got one more minute to work on myself. I got five more minutes to work on myself. Lord bless, I got another day to work on myself. Because I know in my heart and my soul, I can't go to heaven and be before God any kind of way. I got to be working on myself now while I'm down here on this earth experiencing an inkling of his blessings in order for me to get the full inheritance and to be on that will and to be on that list where he done put my name on there, I got to let Christ dwell in me, take over me, work on myself, so that when I go before the throne, when God looks at me, he sees Jesus. And he ain't seeing James Bernard Connor. Because if he sees JBC, I'm going to hell. So he needs to see Jesus when I go before the throne. That's all I'm saying, saints. You got to work on yourself. We can, you cannot have that attitude that I'm going to inherit heaven and all its blessings and I can live any kind of way and do anything I want to do while I'm here on this earth. And I can just do whatever. Because of what? I'm going to heaven anyway. No, you ain't. You're going to bust verse 8 wide open. I'm just telling you. Deacon Kansas goes and already done elaborated. You're going to bust eight wide open. <laughs> so, as we examine ourselves, chances are that most of us are guilty of some of these sins. If so, we need to do what? Repent and ask God for forgiveness as well as for God's power through the Holy Spirit to make a, make a more thorough progress in the path of sanctification. Lord, work on me. Repent. Ask for forgiveness. Tell the Lord to work on you. To cleanse you. So you can be sanctified. The point of this text is not that we, we earn salvation. You can't earn it through works. But it does point out our responsibility for obedience and perseverance in the Christian life. God's word gives us assurance that Christ's work saves us, but we are always commanded to live as those who are what? Actively following Christ. If we do so, we can live in confident assurance that we would not be cast into the lake of fire at the last judgment. Lord, work on me. Be sincere about what you're asking for. Don't say, Lord, work on me, and you continue lying. 
Work on you. Work on yourself. Get the Lord in you. Work on yourself. So as we close this morning, what would it be like to be able to begin a new? People today are always longing for a fresh start. A new diet, a new job, a new house, a new school, a new marriage. And the list goes on and on and on. Some would take drastic measures to try to change their lives for the better. As Christians, we know that God offers the ultimate new beginning, which is salvation through Jesus Christ. When we are a new creation in Christ, we have the power to stop believing Satan's lies about ourselves and others. We have the power to think of others before ourselves. And we have the power to truly commune with God. We also understand that the joy and peace we experience briefly in this world is just a taste, is just a taste, saints, of what we will experience in God's presence forever. You just getting a little taste. You ever went to an ice cream shop, Baskin Robbins? And you looked at all the flavors of ice cream. And Brother Poe, you was like, do I want Rocky Road? Do I want Sneaker Doodle? You know, do, do I want Mississippi Mud? You know, which, which one do I want? And you said, can I get a taste of this one? And you taste it. Ooh, that's good. Can I get a taste of that cream cheese, that cheesecake? And they gave you the little spoon. And they scooped it, Sister Colleen, and you got that taste. So you might be done tasted Deacon McKenzie, about five of them, Sister Ghost. You, you done tasted them. And now you still standing there like, I just can't make up my mind. <laughs> you know, and you say, okay, I, I want to get, get the cone, the waffle cone. Uh, and, and then they got on the list. You can get one scoop, Sister Teresa, two, three. How many scoops you can get? And you standing there. You know, uh, and, and you just stand there looking. B, BJ, you just looking at it like, and your mama like, hurry up, boy. which one are you going to get? You, mama, I don't know. Well, just get all of them then. And then you just got three scoops and that one little cone. And you got three scoops of it. You, you got three different ones. And boy, you just happy as happy can be. You only got a taste of those different flavors of ice cream. Right now, what we experience in this life, you're only getting a taste of God's blessings. Think about when you get in his presence, when you get in the fullness of all these blessings, when you ain't got to worry about death, you ain't got to worry about stress, you ain't got to worry about bills, you ain't got to worry about none of this stuff, no more. Because in God's presence, sin can't be present, worrying can't be present, none of this stuff can be present. In God's presence. All of this will be gone away. You will be what? New. And so, next Sunday, we're going to talk about a new city. Bible background, Revelation 21, 9 through 27. Printed text, Revelation 21, 9 through 21. And our devotion reading becomes from Revelation chapter 10, verses 1 through 11. I aim for change, tell us that we will explore the possibility of living in a new place. Imagine the richness of serenity of living in the new Jerusalem and celebrate God's provision of a new city for believers throughout eternity. So this morning, I hope that you got something wonderful and, 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 and insightful out of this lesson this morning to help you continue in your Christian walk. I would like to say if you would like to give in our Sunday school class this morning, you can do so by Gibbelify. Um, that will be shown to you that are viewing us live. And for those of us that are present in Sunday school class this morning, you can also give by giving fire, or you can give your money in green right now. And so I pray that you really receive something out of this lesson this morning. May God bless you. May God continue to guide you through your Christian walk. I'd like to thank Reverend Connor for that wonderful, wonderful lesson. Again, I, I was prepared to do the lesson myself this morning. Didn't know he was going to be here. But uh, so I had a double class. I had class with myself. And 
I had class with him today. But it was a wonderful lesson. I uh, hope that you um, just take time to, to let that lesson just soak in. Because again, I say that uh, God is not looking for good people. God is looking for saved people. So let's continue to put our trust in the Lord. Uh, I pray that everybody come out today and, and get the word live. It's, uh, this online is okay, but coming and get it and fellowshipping with your fellow members is better than fellowshipping online. So if you decide to stay at home today, may God continue to bless each and every one of you. Have a wonderful day.